Welcome to Spiritual Transformation, where each week I talk to the spiritually gifted and spiritually transformed. And today I have a special guest, Joan Hyam Schmitz. Welcome to the show, Joan. Hi, Mary Beth. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. So I'm going to go ahead and read your short bio, and then we will get right into the interview, if that's okay. Okay, guys. So meet Joan Hyam Schmitz author of her insightful, brilliant, award-winning book based on her unfathomable trifecta of personal tragedy. The name of her book is Carried by a Feather. It is amazing, you guys. One of the traumatic events in her life was the death of her only child, Mark, at only 20 years old. Joan has become an expert on grief and trauma in the worst way, her personal life story. Joan shares her story of love, loss and grief with honesty candor and raw emotion served with a sprinkling of the divine and you guys that last sentence i read was straight from the back of her book i could not have said it better so i just stole it okay joan thank you so much for this important conversation on grief and trauma that is our topic of the day and as i mentioned in your bio you unfortunately became an expert the hard way so I'm going to let you start wherever you really feel like you would like to start with your story. Um, well, since, and since your podcast is really focused on spirituality, what I yeah. really want to go back and really start, you know, a long time ago with really um, growing up, I developed um, a bit of a, I would call it a phobia or a definite fear of dying of death. Okay. And this was, there's a story behind it. There was something that happened when I was on a family vacation in Germany and I came home from that trip and I just was, became very fearful. So, and I carried that around for quite a while. And then I was a psychology major in college. And one of the classes I took was psychology of death and dying. And actually I used my whole psychology degree actually to like as therapy. I really did. Cause I also have an eating disorder. And so I, majored in psychology took all these psych classes that really were like almost getting therapy you know through a degree and that during the time that i took the psychology of death and dying um was when i really addressed my fears of death and everything and i think that all of those things prepared me for what was going to come in my 30s and then later and so i will fast forward then to i in my 30s I was working in Houston. I was living in Houston at the time and I was working and I met two women at the time that I call my spiritual mentors um, or my spiritual awakeners. And one was my boss and one was a woman I was taking classes from who also was a licensed therapist and she also became my counselor for a while. But it was during that time that I started reading and opening my mind to things. And then my dad, um, who had been on and off been ill, my dad ended up passing away in 1996. Um, yeah, 1996. And it was after my dad passed that I read that book, um, that famous book that came out. It was about near death experience, um, embraced by the light and based yeah. by the light. So it was, was, I had never read any book like that. I didn't know anything about near death experiences or anything like that. And I read the book and I was, I ate it up. I mean, it was like, like, you know, talk about, you know, lights going off or bulbs going off or whatever, just like it just opened this whole world to me. And so between my spiritual mentors and then reading just book after book after book, I mean, conversations with God and just all kinds of different authors that I've read. Um, and I'm still reading. Um, I think all of that. So my dad's passing, meeting those women, becoming spiritually awakened, yada, 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 prepared me for then what was coming, the, the trifecta that you mentioned right. in uh, my intro, which was... Um, I, uh, my husband at the time, uh, was diagnosed with a rare cancer, um, when my son was just six months old. Mm -hmm. And so we were old parents. Um, Alan was 10 years older than me and, um, was diagnosed with the super rare cancer and long story short, um, thought it, it's a three to month three to six month prognosis, but he lasted three years, but he did pass. Wow. And, um, so he passed and I, um, moved my son to Cincinnati, which I was grateful for. I, I, you know, I kind of broke some of the rules that they tell you about not making rash decisions like a year after a major event, not just a death, like a major event, like losing a job or having your house burned down and things like that. So I moved up here a couple months after he passed because my family was here and I wanted help because I had a, and I was now a single mom with a toddler and 
And then 21 months after I moved here and had gotten settled in and whatnot, I was diagnosed with a, a rare form of leukemia. Mm -hmm. um, now, the good news is, unlike Alan, I also had a rare cancer like he did, but mine, his was not curable, currently is still not curable. Mine was highly curable if caught early. So I went through the, I, went, I had to go through two years of treatment for that. And I was pronounced cured after two years. And then literally at the end, I was finishing up my treatment. I was planning this party I was going to have to, for all the people that had helped me, helped me take care of my son, helped me take care, you know, get me to appointments, yada, yada, yada. And I was planning this in my mind. And then my son who was seven now at the time, um, he was five when I was diagnosed, um, came, was diagnosed with type one diabetes. So that's the trifecta that you're referring to mm -hmm. um, that I talk about. And so for a long time, um, and all those three things happened. So Alan getting diagnosed and passing away, me getting diagnosed, and then Mark getting diagnosed with diabetes all happened in the span of like seven years. And it was just, it was mind blowing to have such huge life transforming things happen literally one after the other. And it really took me a long time to, to get my head around all that, so to speak. And so right. during that time, I had an idea to write a story. I had an idea to write this down. This trifecta of trauma was what I was going to call my book at the time. Ooh, yeah, And I didn't. And now I know why I didn't because my story wasn't done because the worst mm. thing that was ever going to happen to me and that can pretty much happen to almost anyone is my son passing away in 2018 suddenly. And I guess I will tell the audience, like I, everything that you're saying, I read your intro, I read your bio, but I know it. I know your story because I was, I've known you for, I guess, 21, 22 years. And by synchronicity moved next door to you. We both moved from Houston to Cincinnati, Ohio, and move next door to each other. Embraced by the Light was one of my first books too, like in my teens, I believe. Um, and one of those books caused me to have a spiritually transformative experience. Like I was, it was like remembering my soul. It triggered this whole two week experience. And definitely it's so, so that's another thing we have in common where we were transformed by reading about near death experience. I actually didn't know that part <laughs> until you just told me, but I did, I did know about the conversations with God. Cause we both were like, oh, that's my Bible, you know? And, um, and, and you were my next door neighbor. And that's when I was like, oh, we're going to be best friends. Like I was, cause it was so great to know somebody who was into all this stuff. And that's what we talked about a lot. And, and so, and I know I, I knew Mark, you know, and just thought he was the cutest little thing. How old was he though? I was trying to remember when so I moved he, in. When you moved in, so we moved here when he was three and a half and you moved in maybe six months or so after that. So he, yeah, was, he was little. Yeah. He was young and, and you were just newly married or fairly newly married and didn't have your son yet either. Yeah. So yeah, you moved in and then you ended up having your son later too. But um, yeah, he was probably about four, four and a half when you moved in. So, and that's why I wanted to invite you is because I was there for it. Like I have never seen to this day, Joan, one person, one thing after another, after another, like you barely come up for air and then something else was, you know, and I didn't know Alan, I didn't know you when, when your first husband um, was, you know, that was, I met you after that, but you told me that whole story and I hadn't even had a chance to process it yet. And then you've got other things going on. I mean, you know, so that's why I'm just so glad that you have, you know, use your experiences to help other people. I love that. I love stories of transformation. I love that you use spirituality through everything. Even when you had leukemia, I remember you were telling me you were seeing a therapist, but you were also doing a lot of spiritual work. Did you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, I can. So yeah, that was, so, you know, I came through all the reading and all the people that I've met, like yourself, I can not call them kindred spirits, so to speak. Mm -hmm. you know, so all I've met tons of kindred spirits. I've met, I've read tons and tons and tons of books and, and then gone to hear people and yada, yada. And I, and through that, I came in my book, there's a chapter in my book called the religion of Joan and the religion of Joan. It's kind of a play on words. Cause I, I'm not religious. I'm, I call myself spiritual, but it, there's nine tenets in there to my religion. So this little religion is nine tenets. And, and those tenets are just the things that I came to learn and believe in through all the reading and, and talking and things that I conversing with like-minded people that I came to, to believe. And those things, those tenets that I talk about, or I list them in that chapter, 
those are what helped me get through all these things that have happened to me. And even beyond that, because now I'm, my son's been gone for five and a half years. Um, and Alan's been gone for 22 years. And so my dad even longer than that. So I've used those things. I used it to help me during that time, but I used it. I've used used it since then as well. And and basically the tenants are just those things that I know you're talking about or having other guests speak about on here. Like we all are one, um, mm-hmm. and that everything happens for a reason. And that, um, we, um, like, I also believe, you know, we can, I don't know if you want to jump right into this, but I also believe that we have an ordained, um, or a kind of written down time frame that we're going to be here that we choose to come in for like a time. blueprint for our life. Yeah. yeah. So we have absolutely our birthday, we have our birthday we have the date that we incarnate and we come in and then unbeknownst to us because we're in human form and we don't need to know our end date but there is an end date out there um, like an exit point that we it, it, some people say people who can channel and see into spiritual realms they say that there's can be sometimes more than one exit point and we might you know we we, we have free will to choose do i want to go sooner or later do i want to hang around longer and you and I joke about all the, all the time, like, what were you thinking when you picked your soul blueprint? Yes, exactly, yeah. yeah. You, yeah, you bit off a lot. Yeah, I did, you know, my therapist, the, the one I mentioned earlier that was my, she became my therapist, but she was one of my spiritual mentors. She would always tell me when I was having counseling sessions with her, you know, you, she'd call me an old soul. I'm not sure if I am or not. It doesn't really matter. But she said, you can't, the most important thing that she would say to me was you came here for accelerated growth. And yeah. so when I look at people that have had experiences like mine, we've all come here for growth. That's why all of us are here. We wouldn't come in if we weren't coming here for growth and to learn and to experience things and whatnot and to raise ourselves, raise our, raise our vibration, raise our, you know, our, ourselves in that spiritual realm. So we're, that's why we're here. And, but she just said people like you that come in with all this stuff and believe me, there's people with far worse stories than mine, far worse stories than mine. Um, but so people that come in with just one trauma after another and just like constantly, you know, just, you know, in, in human form, we like to call it like, you know, it's unfair, like life's unfair, or right. things, but that you really, your soul contract, what you came in here to do and you agreed to do with your people that you came in with or that you're meeting along the way is um, for your growth and your accelerated growth and that, and I believe that I do believe that I must have decided to come in and I wanted to check off a lot of boxes, if you will. Like if there's a checklist and you want to check off a bunch, I said, here, sign me up. I want to check off all a bunch of boxes on this lifetime. And so I did that. And these are some of the boxes I'm checking is right. Things that have happened, you know, in my life, just like everyone else. Um, right. Or- and then when we incarnate, we have amnesia to like, it's easy to, it's easy to create a blueprint of all of these big things when we know what we know on the other side, right? <laughs> Cause we know that all of this is kind of more like a dream and we're just experiencing things, accelerate, this is growth, expansion, all of the things. And we get ex- probably excited about it. But then when we incarnate, we're not allowed to remember like where we that where we actually came from and that we're all one and we're all connected and that that you know it's all bliss and love right but then we're here in human form and it's you know devastating things happen and it's like what in the heck did i sign up for but that you know and it's one thing for you know i've had some tragedies you know my mom died and my best guy friend died you don't get to be you know i'm almost 50 without a lot of people dying right it just doesn't happen but i just have always said people who have children who died that's the it's the worst it's not natural it doesn't feel natural at all so it's it's like so different for you to say all of these things than for someone like me to say it because you know i haven't experienced that level that you have and you know it's just for you to be still uplifting other people, you know, is, is just speaks volumes. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, I think that um, 
like, so if my, if my religion of Joan or my beliefs, it's just like anybody that subscribes to a religion. So let's say if you're a Christian and you believe in God and you believe, and then something horrible happens, I know you've heard this and I've heard this in my life and people kind of turn on God sometimes like, oh my gosh, God took, God took my child. You know, I've, I've been faithful. I, I've gone to service. I've gone to church. I've served, right. you know, and then something horrible happens, like maybe child loss or something. And they, and then they kind of turn on that faith, you know, that faith that they've maybe had the whole life. And the same thing would apply to me. I've had these core beliefs that I, I felt like I was awakened to back in my thirties when I had all those experiences I already mentioned. And so then when down the road, my husband got sick and died, I got sick, uh, my son got sick and then my son died. I like, any like a Christian, I could have turned my back on all that stuff and said, well, you know what? I really did believe everything happens for a reason until my son died. Or I really did believe we all are one and, and we're all part of God. And we're all here having this, um, this human experience or spirits having a human. And I could have, and I could have turned my back on all that, but I, I can't do that. Cause I, I'm too, I'm too aware and I'm too awake to turn my back on that stuff. And so what I've had to do in the five years since my son's passed, and I've been to several mediums during that time. Um, and, I, and I write about one of the mediums in my book, but I, um, I had to, I had to embrace all that stuff that were my beliefs. And I had to come to un an understanding that, and I just saw a medium back in August, again, somebody you referred me to who I love, um, who again, reiterated like other mediums have done Joan, there was nothing you could have done for your son. His time was up. And my son passed from a diabetic episode. He was at his dorm. He was alone in his dorm room at, at school. And he had a diabetic episode and slipped into a diabetic coma and passed away by himself. And she said, if he wouldn't have passed from a diabetic coma or a diabetic episode, he would have died in a car accident. Mm -hmm. or So that you know, there was nothing you or anyone on this planet could have done because his time was up. And that's one of the tenets that I've always believed in, that we come in with a beginning date and we have this end date. And that in that time in between, like they talk about that poem, The Dash, that talks about the most important your life, time of your life is the dash, the important time between birth and death, is that time in between was when all these experience, all the things that anyone's experienced in their lifetime was meant and it was contracted. I mean, yes, we have free will and we, you know, you can go into all that, but a lot of it was contracted or we wrote it down and we included certain people to be, to play parts in that, so to speak. And, um, and to fulfill what I came here to learn and grow and do. And so I know I trust that my, and what I like to say about my son is my son was my son. I gave birth to him. I'm his mother, but I'm not in control of his journey. And I'm not just like, I'm not fully in control of my own journey. I mean, I have free will and some, you know, but there's some things that are, you know, that are going to happen. And so I, if I not even truly in control of my own journey, I could have never been in control of my son's journey. Because I like to say, if I would have been in control, I would have never let my son get type one diabetes. I mean, what right. mom would want their kid to stick their fingers and, and have to get shots every time they ate anything. No mom on this planet would want that for their child. So if I was ever in control of his journey, I would have, I would have nipped the diabetes in the bud if I had that kind of control and I don't. And so I have to, um, intellectually and spiritually remind myself and I'm still doing that uh, because I am in human form that it was my son's time. And yeah, and it was, and he did what he was supposed to do. He had, a, he made a great impact in the short time he was here, I believe on people that he crossed paths yeah. with, with his own writing, but it was, he was done just like his dad was done when he left the planet, you know, at the right. age of 50. and so, um, I have to constantly go back to the things that are my faith and remind myself that I believe in these things wholeheartedly. And then that's what's helped me navigate these traumas and losses. And since you brought up free will and destiny, the coolest way I have to tell, I have to tell you this because it's like, it fits right in. The, the coolest way I've heard it explained, and um, this is loosely quoted from Bashar, if anyone who knows Bashar, very cool, he channels. Um, well, Daryl, Daryl Anka channels Bashar, put it that way. But the way he described it was the first time I actually understood it. So like we've got the blueprint, which is like our, our destiny, like we, we set that. 
But like, let's say the blueprint would be like, okay, you're going to be, it's like just the way he put it as example, in a hallway at this time in your life at age 42 or whatever. And, but your free will comes in, like the, the blueprint is you're in the hallway. The free will comes in is, are you going to turn right? Are you going to turn left? Or are you going to go straight in that hallway? So it's like, it's like, we've got some things. And I thought that's a really cool way of explaining it, you know, because they're both true. Some things are predestined and some things are free will. And then we also have other people's free will involved. And it gets, I think our brains would blow up, honestly, if we really <laughs> tried to wrap around like how complicated and then there's different timelines, parallel lives and all these like, wait, what? You know, so quantum physics gets really, I'm so intrigued by it, but also I understand like we're probably not supposed to understand all that. That's why we get amnesia when we incarnate. Sure. Absolutely. No, I, li I like the way that free will is explained. I haven't heard that before. but I Yeah, know. that's the first time I was like, oh, okay, I, I actually got that with the visual. So what would you tell people? And I know you helped me with this, but I'm going to ask you, what would you tell people who um, are uncomfortable? Because I myself didn't know what to say to you. You know, like I was like, I is it okay? I even asked. So I, when I don't know what to do, I'm, I'm a pretty good communicator. I'm just going to ask you, what do you want me to do? <laughs> so what do you tell people? who feel uncomfortable talking about death or asking someone who just had a recent loss. Um, what, what's your advice for those people who are really uncomfortable and with the whole topic in general? So I, I would start with, um, you know, in the U S especially, and this may be in other countries, but of course we live here. Um, we definitely live in a death phobic society here in the United States. I've been volunteering with hospice on and off since I was in college. So back again, when I was majoring in psychology, taking death and dying, I, that was my first time I ever volunteered with a hospice in the, in the town where I was going to college. And then um, I got away from it and then came back to it. I'm currently affiliated with the hospice here locally that I volunteer and go and sit with patients um, to relieve a caregiver or just provide company if a patient needs company like in a nursing home situation, but it's somebody that's been done, then admitted to a hospice and with six months or less to live is the criteria. So in, so in, you know, just knowing our country and knowing how people are and then working in, in death, like working in a field of uh, volunteering in a field that's about death, um, people just in general, um, and like I said, this could be other places too, but I can only speak to our country just are very uncomfortable talking about death. Not only the death of a loved one or a friend, but their own and their own mortality. So it really starts with having a fear of your own mortality because so there's like, I, I'm fine with my mortality. I know where I'm going. I know what's waiting for me on the other side. You know, in general, I don't know everything. Yeah. <laughs> I know a lot of what's going to happen when I do stop breathing and my soul leaves my body, and I know some of the initial things that are going to go on and what what I, you know what's going to happen. Um, but people that maybe don't have those beliefs or don't know what to believe or whatever, or have been taught that you know other things through religion or just their upbringing in general, they don't. So they don't feel comfortable talking about death, not only the death of your spouse or your friend, but their own death. So if we can't even have conversations about mortality because people don't even want to, they don't want to do planning. I mean, that was some of the people I worked with in hospice, you know, spent a lot of their days trying to get people to do wills and power of attorneys yeah. and medical directives, because all that's important and people put it off and put it off and kick it down the can. I mean, I'm, ta I'm not talking about 20 year olds. I'm talking about 80 year olds that don't want to have those conversations because they don't want to talk about it. So with that said, when you're living in a society where people don't like to talk about death, you know, even their own, then when you have a loss and, and especially a loss that's so to speak in human terms out of order. So like child loss out of yeah. order. We look at that as a human is out of order. It's out of our natural way that we expect life to go. And the good news is for most people, you're never going to bury a child. Your kids are going to bury you because for most people, that's how it works. You know, you're going to live to be a certain age or your, kid, your kids are going to grow up. You're probably going to die and have grand, great grandkids even. And your kids are going to bury you and you're going to follow the natural cycle. You're going to live to be 80, 90, 100, have this wonderful family and, you know, and then pass away. And your kids are not going to, you know, you're not going to bury any of your children. So when something like child loss happens, so I, I can speak to some of the things that happened when my husband passed, who was 50 when he passed, but I can really see the uncomfortableness and the um, the loss of words and things like that that people have because they don't want to talk about dead kids. They don't. 
and, and they just don't. So what's happened or what I've been witness to a lot in these past five years is just people don't say anything. And, um, and so, because they are fearful that they're going to say the wrong thing. And some people do say the wrong things. I've got many examples of that. Um, and, um, and again, not judge it's, I'm not saying that in a judgmental way. It's, I mean, the things they said aren't helpful or even beneficial and can be hurtful, but I know that people try to do their best, but they don't because we don't have these conversations because we just don't talk about death. Can we go over those things? Because I think that most of us like want to know what should I not say? And then also, what should I say? <laughs> yeah, and I, and actually, so my, when I went and spoke to that, when I had that session with that medium you referred me to back in August, at the end of my session, she um, told me that I was supposed to be writing something else and that she didn't know that it was necessarily a book, but it was supposed to be about grieving or mm -hmm. trauma is what she said. And after I hung up with her that day and I thought about it for a couple of days, I actually have an idea of something to write. And some of that idea is exactly what you're asking me. Like a how-to book. <laughs> Like how to talk to grieving people for dummies. Okay. So it's kind of like a, how to talk to grieving people for dummies. And I mean, that wasn't maybe going to be my working title, but that's the gist of it is like how to step-by-step kind of show people or, or give examples of, you know, what's a good thing to say and what's a not good thing to say. And so one of the things I can start with is what I just said earlier. And one of my religious tenets is everything happens for a reason. So when you take, so take that tenet of mine and I was on a grief, I was on a child loss group for a while on Facebook. The woman ended up having to take it down because people were ugly on there, believe it or not, just like it is everywhere on social media. She ended up having to take it down. She herself had lost her daughter. And, um, but in that group, I would see a lot of posts where people don't like you to say everything happens for a reason when it's in relation to their child dying. They mm -hmm. don't. They don't want to hear that there was a reason why their child, whatever, one years old, five years old, 20 years old, passed away. And they don't like that. So, um, so again, so like for me, you could say everything happens to a reason for me and that, you know, Joan, there was a reason why Mark's journey ended on that day at that age, at that time in that place. And I can, I'd be like, yeah, I know, but you can say that same thing to somebody that doesn't believe in that. And, and would actually probably get angered by you saying that there was a reason why their child died. So sometimes those kinds of things, like for that particular thing, because I would see that a lot. And I've seen that on other posts. I've been, I'm in another loss group where I was that was for adults and people that lost parents and things where I've seen that same thing said. I don't like, mm -hmm. I don't believe everything happens for a reason. It wouldn't be something I would say, like just out of common sense. However, I'm like you. It wouldn't bother me because of my belief system. So we, we, I, that's why we have to be careful is what you're saying. Cause we don't know in advance what somebody's belief system is. And I never, so I, I don't like anybody pushing their belief system onto me. And I certainly don't push my belief system onto anybody else. The only person that I have these kind of conversations in general with are people that are like-minded or people that I know I can talk about this kind of stuff with, and they understand what I'm talking about. They agree with it. They've heard it before, blah, blah, blah. So, so those kind of things. But I think, I think, you know, without going into like just nitpicky little sentences, like somebody said this or somebody did this or whatever, I think what I what I most have noticed, I would have to say in this past five and a half years is just um, the, that, that people just say nothing. They just say nothing. And that's that, what I was getting at because that was my question to you. And you were like, um, I haven't forgotten. You know, I think about it every day, all day. So it's not like you're reminding me. And I was like, ooh, that's perfect. I needed to hear that. Makes great sense. Quote. There's a great <laughs> quote out there. Do you, if you remember, remember Elizabeth Edwards? She was married to John Edwards. She, they had a child. He was a he was a he was he ran for president several you know many. Years. When you say John Edwards, I think of the psychic. So yeah, so, John, so they Elizabeth Edwards was married to him, and they were a political family, and they lost a child. And there's a great quote out there um, that I actually saved on my phone, but I've, and I've used it. I'm not going to quote it directly. I'm not, I'm going to botch it, but it, the gist of her quote is, um, don't think that when you bring up my child's name, that you're reminding me that my child's gone. I've never forgotten my child and I never will forget my child. So please speak my child's name. Mm -hmm. It actually brings me comfort for you to speak my child's name. And I love, and that, so that's not the direct quote, but that's a gist of what she was saying. And that's, 
that's really it in a nutshell. I am never, ever going to forget that my kid's not here. But, you know, so if, if you walk up to me and I'm at Kroger and you walk up to me and say something, and I, I love when people do this. Oh my gosh, Joan, I just want you to know just the other day I was thinking about Mark or I was thinking about you, or I was wondering what you were doing, you know, and, and so don't think that standing in Kroger, when you say my kid's name out loud to me, that I'm going to, you know, break down in tears or fall on the floor, even if I did, who cares? Okay, but the bottom line is to say nothing is far worse than to bring up my son's name or to bring or to ask me. And here's the thing that, that my biggest thing is where I'm at right now is just ask me how I'm doing. Because even though in your mind, I think people, when we talk about grieving, people think it's something that you get over. You don't get over it. There's no, mm -hmm. I don't believe that anymore. I don't ever say that to anybody. Grieve something you're going to get over. Like an X amount of months or X amount of time, you're going to get over this. There's no getting over it. It's a living alongside it or finding purpose in your life in the absence of somebody that you're missing that was important to you or special to you or part of your life. And so there's no getting over. So even in your mind, so I think sometimes when people think, well, gosh, it's been five years, she's over that. And I think there are people that honestly believe that. So they don't want to bring it up. They don't want to ask you how you're doing. They don't want to mention your child's name or your whoever you lost because they think you're over it or they think you're going to burst into tears or melt into a puddle on the, on the floor or something. And, and that's so untrue. It, I think yeah. that, I think if you gathered up all kinds of grieving people and the people with all kinds of losses and you ask them, would you prefer to never have it mentioned? Or would you, I think most people would want you to mention it. They'd want you to acknowledge that, yeah, it's been five years, but I'm still in pain and I will, right. always be in pain. I will never get over it. You know what I mean? Well, it's like, it's the waves. Like, cause I know like two, and everybody's different. Like I, when my mom first died and I, my, my friend saw me at Kroger. So it was funny that you said that because she also knew my mom. And she was like, I was like, don't, don't talk about it. Don't talk. Like I didn't want, I wasn't ready because I didn't want to start bawling my eyes out at, at Kroger. You know, I was just trying to, cause it had just happened. So I think too, there, there is a lot, I would say for me, it, it's gotten easier. It's been almost two years on Christmas day. It'll be two years since my mom died. And it definitely, but it's waves. It's like, sometimes I'll forget. It's so weird. I'll drive by her house. I'm like, oh my, like it's, it's such a weird thing. Like how you can wake up and remember again. Yes. Does that yeah. make sense? <laughs> no, no, absolutely. No, I totally get that. No, I totally get it. Cause there's, there's times that, you know, people talk about wanting to pick up the phone. Like, let's say it is a mother that you've lost and something great happened in your life. And the first instance is, oh, I got to call my mom. And then it's like, oh, yeah. shoot, mom's gone. You know, and I, and I know that that happens to people. And so I think that, um, I think that you know, probably, you know, I've been, I don't know if you're familiar with, and I, and I don't want to get way off topic, but um, conversations, um, uh uh, death over dinner. I don't know if you've ever heard of death over dinner. Yeah. You told me about it. And I almost, I almost went to one and I didn't cause I got to admit, Joan, I'm one of the people who used to be super uncomfortable. So I'm one of the people you're describing and you've totally helped me through that. And by the way, thank you the other day, because I was talking to my neighbor when, you know, and he had confided, he told me that his son had shot himself seven years ago. And, um, then I texted you because I told him about you because of something he said. And, and then he said, will you text her and ask her if, you know, what she did with the furniture because their son's room was untouched. And what did you say? Like, it was a really good thing. And he was really thankful for your, for your reply. So you, you tell him what you said, because I liked what you what you did. So I said that uh, when my son passed almost immediately, um, I, um, I donated, he had, he was into clothes. He had a ton of clothes, clothes that were really nice that he took care of. They were, they were, some of them were barely worn, but some of them were expensive. And so I methodically, I, I, I'd say I spent about six weeks um, shortly after he passed away. I went back to work for briefly and then I ended up retiring from my job. So at the end of March, he died on uh, March 6th and I retired officially on like March 31st. So in April for weeks um or many many days i just methodically uh donated and got rid of his stuff so i did sell some to a resale shop 
I did, I gave some to his cousin who could wear some of it that he was close with, like a brother. His cousin was like a brother, his, both his cousins. And I also, um, here in Cincinnati, um, uh, affiliated with UC, um, one of the branches, the suburban branches of UC, they, um, do a clothing drive for, um, clothing that kids can wear for job interviews. So when they're getting oh, ready cool. for interviews for internships or after graduation, so he had a lot of nice clothes. He went to a, a parochial high school and had to wear collared shirts and things. So I had all this stuff. So I, I drove, uh, you know, 45 minutes to an hour to go. And I had to get a wheelie to wheel it all in how much clothes I donated for that cause. And then we also drove up to his university it was only 30 minutes away. And we drove up to his college and met with met for dinner with some of his college friends. And I had put a bunch of stuff in the trunk. And I opened up the trunk when we got after dinner and let them pick things. And so for me, I got rid of all that stuff. I, I kept his furniture intact up until last year. But I, I it was important to me to give away his things because I wanted them to be used. And that brought me joy was knowing that his stuff was not sitting in my closet, getting old, getting out of date, gathering dust or whatever, and that people were using them. And then when they were using them, the ones that the people that knew him, they would think of him when they took his, put his ball cap on that they took, or uh, somebody took a belt or a shirt that they would think of him um, when they were wearing them. And then I they love were, that. And so I, uh, and p not everybody does that. And again, it's a very personal thing, how people do things like that with belongings from people that pass, but that was important to me. And I felt like it was also something that he would have wanted me to do with his things. That he I have some of Mark's stuff. You gave Spencer a couple things. And you know, another thing that I really love that you've said and did is when you got rid of his furniture, you said he had a lot of dark stuff and it kind of lightened up the room and took some of the darkness off of the whole, like yeah. you, metaphorically as well. Exactly. His furniture was dark and heavy. Uh, this like platform bed that was black. And then he had, I mean, the furniture was black. He had a black desk and a black dresser and the room was painted dark and um, he has a blackout shade in there. So the room was dark and heavy. And so all of a sudden, so I kept it that way, kept the same linens on there, all that. And then all of a sudden, I think it was the beginning of last year, 2022, I just decided I'm not going to keep this. And I actually donated all that stuff. And actually I have a really cool story about his desk to somebody I donated the desk to on Facebook marketplace. That ended up being a really cool story, but I donated everything. And then I got new things and painted the room and, and just brightened it up. And so I still have his, some of his things sitting in there, photos of him, books of his, I, I still have things of his in there on display, but the room doesn't have that dark, sad energy. Mm -hmm. I don't anymore um, did you say you made it kind of more feminine like yeah it's a little bit more feminine um you know that maybe the comforter and things i put on there a little bit more fam or girly or whatever you want to call it <laughs> but it's definitely lighter and brighter and that that room doesn't feel like this room of gloom um which is kind of how i would have described it um the way that i had kept it so i you know over this course of this five years then i've i've got most of his things um yeah and then like clothing and other things that he had. I mean, I have some things, but most of it I don't. And I love that, like you, you're, you said, it brought you joy to give this stuff away instead of just sitting there. And, that, and that's what I think we're supposed to be doing. And, it, and I get that it's hard because I get it. It's hard for me too. Um, but to celebrate people's life. And like, I think about it this way when it comes to when I die, the last thing I want is my son being like depressed and stopping his life and not living, you know, when I want him to not think about my death at all. I want him to think about my life and the, the, the good stuff. But what do a lot of people do? They focus on the end. They focus on like, if it was a longer, like suffering before they die, they focus on that, you know, and cause my mom had some of that. So I have to stop myself and be like, wait a minute, that was just this little percentage of her big life. Yeah. Like, why would we focus on that? It's almost like dishonoring, yeah. you know? Yes. Yes. And their I, life. I, I mean, I can't speak to people that lose their kids. I mean, my kids was a sudden death, but he was also living with a life threatening illness, but people that lose their children to suicide or a family yeah. member. And not like my neighbor. That's why, that's why it was so helpful. Like, and that's probably why he's, they're stuck yes, a lot. And I, and I, I think that I, I've often, I said this even before my son ever passed just and in, in experiencing, you know, having people pass away. My mom passed away before Mark did and things like that. I've lost a lot of people. I'm 63 years old, but I, I like to say that, um, 
um, you just, if you hang on, I, it's kind of what you're saying. Like, I don't want to hang on to that, that last bit, you know, kind of thing. But with the people that lose kids to, or family members to suicide, car accidents, um, things like that. And I've always, I've long said this. I think every death is, even if you, like with my husband, he was in hospice for 12 days. He'd been sick for three years. I knew, you know, I had known that he was not going to make it. So there's some mental separation that comes with the death where there's yeah. an or hospitalization, hospice care, whatever, that there's some mental preparation that comes in. Doesn't mean that it's still not horrible when they pass, you know, and that you're not sad and that you don't grieve. It doesn't, but that the ones where there's a sudden passing, especially if someone younger too, right. on top of it, that that there's a surrealness about that, 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 that prolongs the grieving or even delays the actual grieving. Cause you're just in this I don't even, I can't even get my head around. I it. think his son was 20 also, the same as yours, yeah, you know. So they're here one second, they're alive and well, and, you know, and my son was well, he was living, he had had his, three months before he passed away, he had A1C is a measure of your glucose over a three month period, mm -hmm. and A1C is a test. He had gone in for his checkup in November and had his best A1C in the 12 and a half years he'd been diagnosed. And then he was gone three months later. So as a parent, you go to that appointment and you find out he's got his best A1C ever, ever in 12 and a half years. And then he's gone three months later. And so I think that those kind of deaths and regardless of the age of the person, but definitely worse when it's yeah. a younger person is just, there's a surreal, you're walking around like numb and in a cloud because you can't even believe it. Cause one second they were here, like, or in a car accident situation, they were on their way home from school, work, wherever, and they're gone. And I think those add to the grieving process. Trauma. Yeah, trauma. And they and they even delay it because I think you're just in this surreal space for X amount of time while you're just even, you know, waking up like you talked about, waking up and remembering every day that they're gone. And that yeah. for so that even to get into your brain and to kind of permeate it, your brain so that you, okay, they're gone and now I can start grieving. But there's this there's time where you're just walking around like what happened? Surreal and like the word that you use, unfathomable, unfathomable. Yeah, That's hard to say. It is. Um, you kept bringing up the medium that I recommended to Julie Lowenstein. She's actually going to be on the show on, I think, December 1st. It's either de December 1st or the 8th, but she's going to be on the show. And I, I actually recommended her to my neighbor because she specializes in suicide and sudden death too. So um, like that's like one of her specialties. Um, so I think he's going to contact her, but he has talked to other mediums as well. And he said it's the most healing that he's he's had, you know, is is through being able to connect with his son and discuss because it was since it was suicide. I'm trying to get away from that sunlight coming here <laughs> since it was suicide. You know, it's like there's all these unanswered. Yes. Oh, I can imagine. Questions. And, and of course, the biggest guilt of a parent could have, what could I have done to prevent this? Right. And I even had some of that too. I, I yeah. still a little bit of woulda, shoulda, coulda. And I think that that's just natural being in human form, being a mother um, to woulda, shoulda, coulda, because I feel like I missed some things or I could have done some things or I needed to have intervened. And, you know, and I've done some of that. I, 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 I probably do less of it now. I mean, I'm farther down the road. But, and then, but then speaking with the mediums who re constantly reinforce for me, and even my own son who's come through in these readings, that it was his time. It was his time. Yeah. He's fine. He's fine. He, his dad and his grandfather crossed him over and he wasn't alone and he's thriving and um, he watches over me. And I mean, and so, you know, for the people out there that are skeptical about mediums, and I understand that again, I don't try to wish my beliefs on anybody or push my belief systems on anybody. And I, and likewise, I appreciate when that it's not done to me either, but when it comes to mediums, um, if you get a good one and you got to, you got to do your research because, you know, just oh, like there everybody. are, yeah, there are it's in every profession. I mean, that's not even talking mm -hmm. about the medical school and all this, you know, like you, your word, woo woo. There's bad doctors, there's bad nurses, mm -hmm. there's bad lawyers, there's bad accountants, you know what I mean? So every profession has people that are, you know, not good at what they do or shouldn't be doing what they do. Or straight up lying and manipulating. Not. And and I, I know that that's true, but but we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. No. I've had too many experiences, in even myself with um, spiritual psychic stuff. I can't, I mean, 
I know, and I know that I know that I know it's a knowing because I've had him personally, but I, I get when people are skeptical, if they've not had any first hand experience. So what I, you know, so what, so what I find, what I love to be able to say to anybody that's lost to anybody, but especially children too, um, because that's so traumatic for a lot of people, but, um, is that I feel that if you were to find a reputable mediums and there's plenty of them out there and so, you know, some, I know some, and you know, a lot of people, there's reputable mediums all over this country, all over the world. But if you were to connect with one and just go in with an open mind, okay. And find one that you're, you know, you don't see the medium, you, they don't tell them anything. You walk in, you come to your appointment or if it's on the phone or whatever, and they start talking to you. And, and so, and you know, you know, this early on, you'd know if you were talking to a fake or not. Okay. Or if they're just, you can like, feel it. Yeah. They generalize or they give you, you know, stuff vague, that, yeah. <laughs> vague or just stuff that everybody knows kind of thing. But if you were to, if you were to find a reputable one and, and make an appointment and sit with one and, and allow them to do their work and allow your loved ones to come through and that I promise you, you would be given information that you know that they could not have looked up. They could have not researched. They could have not found on Facebook. They could have not done anything that they are truly talking to those souls on the other side and they're giving you that information and those souls are choosing to show up for that appointment so they can come through and say, um, you know, Hey, yeah, you know, I see that you cried for me and everything. Don't do that. I'm good. It was my time. You are a great mom or whatever they want to say to you. Well, even that could be considered vague. Of course, someone's going to cry, but I've had them tell me like they, they brought up, Oh, the, I mean, so many times things that like I did the day before, like, oh, remember when you burned yourself with a curling iron yesterday, the, yes. they were there. And that's what spirit loves to do is give you this very like um, impossible for that for that psychic to know. Yeah, I did just burn myself with the curling iron yesterday and I've got this big yes. thing on my arm. <laughs> that's happened to me numerous times, countless times. Yes. And in my book, in the chapter on the medium, um, Mark um, initially in the first days and weeks did was doing all kinds of electronic stuff in our house. Mm-hmm. So he was turning on lights. He actually more than once set off the car alarm on his car. So his car was parked in our driveway and he would, we went in our kitchen window looks right out to our driveway. So the first time we were all eating dinner and the car alarm just went off. Okay. Did car alarms go off sometimes? Sure. So I got up from the table and got the clicker and clicked it off. You know, mm-hmm. And um, and I can't remember what happened again then, but then the last time he did it was at one in the morning and I actually woke up in the middle of the night and his car alarm was going off. So my husband had to get up, go out. He went outside and in order to get it to turn off, he had to disconnect the battery. And so what we decided to do, it has got full body goosebumps. <laughs> battery got up the next morning and decided we had taken everything out of the car and I was driving it occasionally just to drive it. And we decided that, um, just in case it wasn't Mark doing it just in case, um, we would leave the car unlocked. So therefore the, the, the alarm wasn't even engaged. And, um, and so if it happened again, we knew that we didn't even have the alarm on, but when I went to the medium and we were talking and he was, Mark was there and he was speaking, Mark fessed up to turning on the alarm through the mm-hmm. medium. And he had done that and the medium shared, did, did, was he doing stuff at your house? And was he doing this and that? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He fessed up to it. He's actually laughing about it is what. And that you're talking about Thomas Winlow. Yes, Thomas Winlow. And he said it first, you didn't say, Hey, was it? Yeah. No. And, and that's what some people like would think, that that's not what we're doing. Like we know how to talk to a, a media, a psychic medium without giving, giving it away. Yeah, and, and a good one will tell you, don't feed the medium. Don't tell me yeah. anything. A good one will tell you that up front. Don't tell me, don't tell well, me what you're here. Don't, you know, let it. Exactly. Yeah. Late last week when I interviewed Lincoln, he would not let me tell him a word. He didn't want to know any questions because he was channeling and 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 be in the in the present moment what you know and i don't want to know anything and i mean he doesn't have one mistake in his channeling you listen to it it's it's amazing yeah so yeah so definitely I, I, legit i think that for me and like again not trying to i think for me going to a medium was uh and i've, I've done some therapy since I've, I've i went and saw a therapist for briefly after mark passed away i've 
I actually, for the first time ever in my life, actually went on a very low dose antidepressant. So I've done things, I've done things to try to help myself right. but navigated all this, but I'll tell you hands down the best thing that I've ever done. And the, the best money I've ever spent was sitting with the medium and having Mark come through and having information relayed to me and having my belief system reiterated, you know, the things that I do believe in, like, for example, that his time was up and there was nothing I could do because it, I'm not in control of that journey. He's, that was his journey. Yes. He was my human son, but he was on his own journey here. He had his own social, you know, his spiritual contract. He had his own agenda for why he was coming here and how long he needed to be here to do those things that he needed to do. And so right. that uh, above anything else, whether it was journaling, whether it was therapy, or anything by far the mediums that I've seen and the information that's been given to me and my husband has shown up, my parents have shown up, my grandparents have shown up at different appointments. Um, Mark has always shown up. Um, but that information has, I know has helped me more than any other thing that I've done um, as far as trying to navigate this journey of grief. Yeah. It's like therapy accelerated. Like it's, it's therapy on crack. <laughs> Because the, no one else can give you that information. It's kind of like when I'm doing coaching, I'll get like downloads and all this stuff. Like that's so much more than just regular coaching when you start being able to tap into something and you're like, I don't even know where that came from. <laughs> and they're like, oh my God, I can't believe you just said that. Like it just is, it gives it a boost, right? It's yes. above and beyond regular. Like my point with Julie Lowenstein in, in August, like what I got done with her in an hour, I would have had to see a therapist for six weeks to get all that information out. But all the things that she already knew, because I'll give you an example. When you talk about my my journey and what I signed up for here, one of the very first things she said to me after she asked me how I knew of, how I found her, which of course was you, after we you know did that little housekeeping stuff, the very first thing she said to me when after she had prayed and got her mind ready to start the session um, the very first thing she said was, oh my gosh, Joan, you signed up for some kind of life <laughs> was the very first thing she said. And so, um, and I'm like, yes, I did. Yes, I did. And then she proceeded to tell me about my life. It wasn't the other way around. I did not. Right. She I didn't tell her a damn thing about you. Yes. And so that, that's the thing is, I think that that's why going to a medium, what I, the information that she and I exchanged and the, all that was. I would have had to spend weeks telling a therapist that same information to give her all the background where Julie, by, you know, just opening up her mind to my journey and looking into my journey or whatever was already could see what I've been through. She already could see it all. She saw all of what I've gone through. So I like your kitty. I think it's a great background. Yeah. He just too, like, I'm like, can you still hear me? Because no, I can. No, I can be fine. Yeah, he, he unplugged the microphone for a second, so it was just only a little bit. I was like, "All right, yeah, I didn't plan on him visiting, but yeah, he does that sometimes during my Zoom sessions." I was snooping around, but she didn't jump up. I see her. Up. Oh, she's back there. Yeah, she's back there. Yeah, on the couch. Yeah, in here, but she didn't jump up today, so she's just hanging. Do out. Do you have a dog too? No, not anymore. I just. I thought I saw a dog in the backyard though. Uh, Earlier. No. No, I don't. It might not have. It wasn't my dog. No. I okay. There was somebody like, and I mean, I'll, I'll watch this back. We're going to see there was some. <laughs> there might have been somebody back there. Yeah. No, I don't. Or it was my imagination. It was a ghost dog. Yeah. Maybe so <laughs> what did you say? One of my, maybe one of my dogs came through. Yeah. Joining us. Oh. Who knows? So I'm, you know, Joan, um, I was, I really want people to know, and, and, and I'm going to put, I don't know if I already said this, but I'm going to put the link to Amazon on this because it's one of the best books ever. And it's, well, it's going to help so many people when they read it. And, um, I'm going to make sure that we put that on there. Where can people find you? So I'm not, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of social media and, and with all the, all the stuff that's going on in the world, I've actually backed out of some of my social media because I just can't, I just can't stomach a lot of it. And, and so I get it. Yeah. So I, um, I'm really just on Facebook. Um, I, I deleted my Twitter account. I was on Twitter when my bu book first came out. Um, so I'm on Facebook at Joan Stavrohan. It's, um, and I'm also, um, I also have a website 
um, at Joan Heinz Schmitz. And I also have a blog. I, I'm not writing regularly at all on there, but I have a blog called Joan's Jottings that's on a uh, WordPress. Um, so it's a WordPress blog. You can Google Joan's Jottings. And I, a lot of my previous writing, uh, it's a lot of essays and things. There's things I've written about my son that are on there um, that I wrote maybe in his first couple of years after he passed away. There's some things, but um, so I have my blog and then I've, I'm on Facebook and then, um, and then I have a website. Um, um, Joan Heim Schmitz and um, and that's that's pretty much it because I just I, at this time I just can't stomach a lot <laughs> and I know that that's totally against what you're supposed to do if you have a book and all that stuff but I just can't I can't do the social media thing to any great degree so at least not right now so and I'll make sure my, my cat keeps unplugging the phone I'll make sure that I put all of your links in show notes can you still hear me yes I can hear you. yeah okay for a second, I couldn't hear you. I was like panicking. Oh my gosh. Okay, perfect. He's like rubbing against the computer here. So if you could leave everyone with advice about any type of trauma, tragedy like yours, like what's the, what's the number one thing that you want to leave for the world to know? Is talk about it. Talk about it. Get it out. Because I'm a firm believer that what we hold in, any kind of emotions that we hold in, um, you know, when we don't want to express ourselves by crying or writing or just talking about things, I think that it, it's, it's, there's a danger there of poisoning your body. Cause I do believe we're mind, body, spirit. And that when you're, when you get one out of balance, um, that it can throw things off and it can welcome in illness and, and disease and things like that. So I think that, um, whatever you're going through, it doesn't have to even be death, you know, or, you know, you lost your job, your marriage broke up, you know, you know, whatever that I think talking, you know, I'm a huge proponent of therapy, you know, I love that you are doing your life coaching and, and things like that. And I just think it's, we just need to talk about it. And then like I, I briefly said earlier, when it comes to death, I, we definitely need to be talking and there's yeah. things out there. There's a lot of books you can read, but there's also death over dinner. Michael Hebb, H-E-B-B is a, a guy that started death over dinner. You can find him on Facebook. You can look him up. You can Google him. He's the one that started this death over dinner um, thing many years ago and he does it all over the world. And basically what the concept is to bring eight to 12 people together at a table for dinner, for a meal and to talk about death. And I facil I have facilitated a couple death over dinner groups with the hospice I was affiliated with. And then also locally here in Cincinnati, if you're in our area, um, there's a group that does um, death cafes. And so um, Bill, um, Bill Gupton was actually running the death cafes and there's a woman running them now and I'm escaping her name. But if you Google death cafe, she's in our area and they're all over too. And, and, and again, it's bringing people together. She meets once a month at different locations around town, again, to bring people together to talk about death and to talk about, you know, everything concerning death, you know, your own losses, what, what you think happens when we leave here, you know, just all those kind of things, but just talking about, um, just getting out there and talking about it because, and this sounds blunt and this maybe sounds, you know, yucky, but I, my, my one, my one go-to sentence I say all the time is none of us are getting out of here alive. None. There's not one of us. Some of it's us true. get to stay for a hundred years and some of us get to stay for a couple months or anywhere in between. But the bottom line is none of us, are, none of us are getting out of here alive. We're not, we, we're all going to, um, we're going to experience loss and then, we're going to pass at some point in time. Uh, yeah. So, um, talking about, talking about these things and, 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 you know, and if, if you're struggling with your grief, if you're feeling stuck or you're feeling, talk to somebody, you know, and, right. and, and there's, you know, obviously there's therapists out there, but there's, there's grief support groups all over um, that you can get through churches, hospices, things like that. Um, but it's just talking about it and not holding that in because I think the holding in is what then, can bring other issues and, and make absolutely I, I say i do those videos all the time where i'm like you cannot because i'm a law of attraction coach too you know and so i te i teach law of attraction and a lot of people think you know they, they just try to do the spiritual bypassing thing where you're just like positive vibes only and that's not the real that's that's called denial when you suppress your feelings still there in your body and it's exactly it's exactly what you just said earlier is it causes disease yes, disease in your body it does, it does. You, you know you can't you're it's it's not suppressing them doesn't mean they're not there you're just literally in denial you're going to cause yourself a, a whole bunch of trouble because of the mind-body connection so 
Um, you can't do the spiritual bypassing thing, you guys. You got to feel your feelings. It's okay. You don't need to be, be attached to your feelings. A lot of people think we are our thoughts, right? But we're not our thoughts. That's when you kind of step out and witness your feelings and and try, you know, analyze them a little bit. Don't dwell on them either, because then you're going to take yourself on a downward spiral. You know, <laughs> be the observer. Yes, yes. So, uh, and that's how I would say is like, talk to somebody, get your, express yourself, and then for those of you that are out there that know someone that's grieving right now because of a loss, you know, and it doesn't have to just be child loss. It's like, talk to them about it. Ask them how they're doing. If you don't know what to say, and this is my other thing too, if you don't feel like you know the words to say and you don't want to say the wrong thing or whatever, then that's why God invented Hallmark because you can buy a car that says it. So to me, there's just not an excuse for not saying anything. So if you're not comfortable saying something to somebody, then you can go to the store and you can find a, a whole section of cards, sympathy cards, you know, thinking of you cards, whatever you want to look at that, that you'll find a quote, I promise you. in one of those cards, that says what maybe you couldn't come up with on your own. And all you got to do is sign your name and put a stamp on it and send it or drop it off. And that, so the not saying anything, the not acknowledging it, the not asking how people are doing. And I don't care if it's been five minutes, five days, five years, the not saying anything isn't okay either. Um, and I promise you, I believe that I could speak for most people that are grieving, if not everybody almost, that they want you to, to speak about their loved one and they want them to be remembered. They want them to be spoken about and they want their grief and their pain to be acknowledged. And they want somebody to ask them, how are you? How are or just you? do what I did. Like, I didn't know what to say. So I asked you like, I, or, or, or just tell someone, I'm uncomfortable. I don't know what to say. Tell me what to say. Like, what should I say? Because I think that that I would respect that if somebody, you know, like, yeah, because we don't all know and that's okay to not know. I, Acknowledge I that. I don't know what to say to you. And that's, and I say to them, I understand. Thank you for saying that, you know, and I actually was at a funeral just a couple of weeks ago and I sat down with a girl that I knew that I'd grown up with and she's younger than me, but I was sitting with her at the church or the service in a she leaned over because she knows I lost my son. I haven't seen her. And she said, well, how are you doing? And I said, well, I'm fine. And then my next sentence right out of my mouth was, and thank you so much for asking me that because I rarely get asked and I really appreciate it. And she was like, oh my gosh. I'm like, no, thank you so much for asking me how I'm doing. Mm. I appreciate it because I don't get asked. I don't get asked very often. Yeah. Because I think in some people's minds, it's that whole thing of they think I've moved on, they've moved on, or it, you know, they're gonna upset me if they bring it, you know, and, and it's none of that's true. Um, I haven't, I'm never gonna get over it. I'm gonna I'm living with it, but I'm never gonna get over it. And yeah. So, um, so I just think that I think we just need to have more conversations. About, yeah. Because this is gonna continue to happen. I mean, and you know, we have more young people than ever dying in our country right now um, due to suicide, mental illness issues, and also cancers are showing, there's several cancers right now that are showing up, colon cancer for one, that's showing up in way more people than it's ever shown up in. So there's, there's stuff going on out there. So mm -hmm. there's gonna be a lot of young people that are passing away and they, and there always have been, but there's an uptick right now in the number of young people that we're losing. Um, and so, you know, I think it's just, I think we need to have these conversations like what you're doing. And so this, this, this tape that you're, this session that you're taping today and, and other people out there like Michael Hebb that are doing this kind of work about getting people to talk about it um, and reaching out and, and connecting with people, whether you join a support group online or in person, yeah. And they could Google stuff like death cafe, cause this will be all over, but that, you know, to find one in their area, yes. death yes. cafe and the dinner, what death, was the other one? Death over dinner, death, death over dinner. dinner. And they can find one in their, whatever area they're yeah. in that those are yeah. great ideas and fantastic support. Yeah. And then of course there's countless books on grieving and, and it's specific to your kind of loss of so child loss, spouse loss, parental loss. You know, there's so many books out there, you know, so if you don't want to go to a therapist or don't have the funds or whatever it is, there's so many ways you can get help by reading books. And, and, you know, and a lot of those are, um, some of them are kind of like how to books, but a lot more memoir kind of type books. Mm -hmm. like, like yours. Yeah. And then there's free podcasts like this one. And, um, so, so Joan, yeah, there's so much free stuff out there. Like YouTube is a fantastic resource. 
And I am going to put all of your information in the show notes for anyone to find you um, and also to find your book, which is an incredible resource and very comforting. And Joan, it's been wonderful talking to you. I appreciate all of your valuable advice. And for anyone here who is into spirituality and spiritual healing, spiritual teachers like Joan, and I'm also gonna be having a a new guest every Friday who are either psychic or they channel, they've had near-death experiences like we were talking about in the beginning. I have people already scheduled to do that. Every Friday, there's gonna be a new episode. So if this is up your alley, please go ahead and hit like. If you like this episode, hit like and share it with a friend who you think needs it. And I appreciate your support, guys. This is a brand new podcast, Spiritual Transformation with Mary Beth. I appreciate you sharing it so we can continue to have fantastic guests like Joan. So, Joan, thank you so much for being here. I know your time's valuable. Thank you so much for all you do, Mary Beth, because you're making a difference. I hope you know that. I hope so. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. And so to the audience, we will say goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.